tonight? Everybody saved tonight? Everybody looking forward to going to heaven? All right. Ready to go tonight? All right. We just might go. Take your Bibles tonight. If you'll open to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 8. One verse tonight, but we'll have a lot of other scripture. Okay. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8, we call this the Beatitudes, or Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and literally what Jesus is teaching here on this whole Sermon on the Mount is Christian living, but He's really giving us and teaching us what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Now had they accepted Him and not rejected Him, those things would have happened. But as you go through the Sermon on the Mount, that's not happening today. And you know that, uh, so just think about it. So, you know, he's teaching that this is how the kingdom of God is going to be once the kingdom is established, and we know that will be the millennium. And then all that Sermon on the Mount, you see those eight, nine Beatitudes will all come into play and be revealed and lived out in the kingdom. And so we're waiting for the coming of the kingdom of our Lord, and that could be right around the corner. All right? In the meantime, we've been looking and studying on inside out, inside out faith, taking the faith that we have on the inside and living it out. And of course that faith that we have on the inside is in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus lives in our heart and in our lives, we're going to live that life outwardly. And we've been learning through all these inside out on some things on how to live and to live that type of life that Christ wants to live. And we've looked at some wonderful subjects along the way. And tonight we're going to look at another one. And uh, as we take a look at it with just one verse here, Matthew 5, 8, the Bible says Jesus said blessed. The word blessed there can be translated happy or fully satisfied are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now you're going to read a verse here in just a minute when God says, nobody can see me and live. And there you go, they're going to go our scholars out there and say, see there, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, let me assure you, there are no contradictions in the Word of God. Not one of them. You need to understand what he's talking about here and so forth. And that's why we study uh, so we know what the Scripture teaches. But let's look at it and read it again. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. We're looking at inside out purity tonight. In other words of having a pure heart. And this is what we're going to take a look at tonight. And Zechariah uh, talked about that a little bit as he takes us into the tribulation hour. And he's talking about that. And it shall come to pass that in all uh, the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. He's talking about during the tribulation period about the nation of Israel and that. But the third shall be left therein. In other words, that's called the remnant 
of Israel. And I will bring the third part through the fire, that is the tribulation hour, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. And that's going to take place near the end of the tribulation hour. So he's prophesying a little bit about that because, you see, today Israel doesn't have a pure heart. Okay? And matter of fact, there is is about as secular and and, and worldly as you can get. Did you know that? And so uh, uh, you just got to understand that. And so this is why uh, Zechariah is prophesying here. Isaiah 57, 15 says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Now God says he dwells in the high and holy place, but watch the next phrase here. With him also, that's you and I, with us also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This is what God wants to do with and for us. He wants to revive the spirit of the humble, and he wants to revive our hearts of the contrite ones. Psalms 51.10, Brother our David the king, after his sin with Bathsheba, I want you to notice what he prays here. He says, create in me. Notice he didn't say create in my neighbor. He didn't say, well, create in, in George. He didn't say create in, 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 the, you know, in Linda or Susan or Sharon or, or Bill or Jim. No, David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, we ask you to bless your word now tonight as we take a look at this uh, inside-out purity of having a pure heart before God. Lord, we ask for your wisdom, we ask for your understanding, your illumination, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide now as we go through this, that he would bring to remembrance all the things that Jesus has said to us, that he would grant us illumination, understanding, and then by all means give us wisdom to apply the understanding we're going to gain tonight about having a pure heart. And Lord, we'll thank you for it and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to look at just three truths here tonight concerning a pure heart. And someone says, okay, what about, uh, what does it mean? Someone was to ask me tonight and popped out and said, well, pastor, tell me, what does it mean to, be a, to have a pure heart? And, uh, and then somebody might say, well, define, please. Well, let's define, first of all, a pure heart from the Scripture, all right? Let's define a pure heart. Number one, a pure heart defined, Okay. We talk and look at it, and we look at the word heart right off the bat. A there in your study guide. A heart, you see. The whole, the heart, the definition of the heart is the whole inner self. It is the totality of the innermost being. It is the central part of man. By the way, the word heart's found 1,000 times in the Word of God, just so you know that. So you see, we're not talking about the physical organ that's pumping blood into our body. We're talking about the spiritual heart of a person that knows Christ, that is saved and born again. We have a spiritual heart. God has made a new creature out of us. We are a new transformation and a new translation, and we have a new heart. That's why the songwriter says, how about your heart? Is it right with God? Everything stems from the heart, church. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, he's not talking about thinking in that organ that's pumping blood in your body. Okay, he's talking about your spiritual heart. And out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaketh. And so we're talking about we've got to define what is a pure heart. Proverbs 3, 5, Solomon put it this way, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. How much of your heart? All of your heart. Trust the Lord. And lean not unto your own understanding. Now that's verse 5 and verse 6 says what? Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he shall direct thy path. Everything stems from the heart. Listen to what John says in 1 John 3, 20 through 21. For if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. 
So when we talk about the heart here, of defining the heart, I believe there are three key ingredients of the spiritual heart of this evening. And that is the heart is a spiritual center, center of the believer's life, and it comes and it deals with three categories. And the first one tonight, it deals with is emotions. How many of you know you got emotions tonight? Well, the emotions come from your heart. Emotions are your heart. And Jesus, that's why Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your heart be what? Troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Now he goes on to in my father's house are many mansions, but we're going to stick with let not your heart be troubled, you see, because we're emotional people. We have emotions. Uh, the emotions come from the heart. The, the most center, central being of, of a believer's life is, is, comes from the heart and, and those emotions. And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be stirred up. Don't let it be agitated. This is what he's saying. God doesn't want you and I to have an agitated heart or a stirred up heart. He doesn't want it to be trouble. And the word agitated there, stirred up, is like a washing machine. It's the best way to describe it. Some of you got old-fashioned ones, and they go this way, you know. Some of you got the jet ones. Right? Amen. You see, what's it doing? It's agitating. It's agitating the clothes and the water to get the dirt out of your clothes. It's, just, it's stirring up the water. God says, don't let your heart be like that. Don't let the world and the things of the world and all the worlds and the troubles of the world and everything get your heart all up, stirred up and, and upset and agitated. You see, that's your emotions, okay? And, and then that's why Isaiah comes back and says in Isaiah 30, 29, you shall have a song as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept and gladness of heart as when one goeth a, a, with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. You see, God doesn't want our heart to be stirred up. God, in our emotions, God wants us to have a glad heart. See, gladness of heart, not a heart that's stirred up, not a heart that's troubled, not a heart that's being agitated. No, God wants you and I, Isaiah says, to have a glad heart. So emotions we deal with this uh, all the time, and we need to be careful with them as we de describe a pure heart. God wants you to have a glad heart. A second thing that we deal with with emotions when it comes to the heart and the central part of it is intelligent, intellect. Do you think about that? Intellect. Your, your heart is, is intellect. You know, where do you get that? Well, Mark 2, 8, okay? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned, Within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? You see, the, 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 the heart, if we define a pure heart, we have to define it. And a heart is that whole inner being. It's a totally uh, inner being, of the, the most being of man, the central part of the man. God doesn't want it to be stirred up and troubled. He wants it to trust in him. He wants us to have a glad heart. And then he calls us to the, to the point where we have intellect. And this is, remember, what's the other one in Isaiah? I believe it is. The Lord says what? Come now, say it to the Lord, and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Reason, that's intellect. So we have the intellect when it comes to having a pure heart defined. You better put some reason into your heart and the decisions of what you're doing. There has some intellect there. Amen. I mean, that's just, that's just part of it. And then I think a third ingredient when it comes to a pure heart defined, as we're defining the heart, and that is the will. The will, a matter of choice. Our will is involved in it when we talk about the heart. So there's emotions, intellect, and will. That's why Daniel said in Daniel 1.8, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, on oh, Daniel's life, Daniel's a teenager here, he says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Where? In his heart. And in, in that part of that emotion of his heart, that part of that intellect of his heart, he purposed what? That he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Will is a matter of choice. You can choose to or choose not to. You can choose to allow your emotions to take over and get you all stirred up and agitated and everything else, or you can choose not to. That's why Jesus said, told them not to. Let not your heart be troubled. 
Now, this was at the Lord's Supper. You've got to understand the last night he's with them and the last few hours and they were gathered around the table and he looks at them and he knows what's going on in their minds and so forth. You know? And he said, hey, fellas, don't let your heart be troubled, agitated, stirred up. He said, and why? He said, if you believe in God, that's a good thing, but you had better believe in me. Because in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he said, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. In the way you know thereof, and the how. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And that's why he could say what he did. And so... It's a matter of choice. It's a, of the will. You've got to exercise your will. And Daniel says, I'm not going to let the world, which was what Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, Daniel was about 18, 19 here, and uh, all the boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're heathen names, okay? They're pagan names that he gave them. We're between 16 and 17. And Daniel's about 19. And Nebuchadnezzar right now is only about the same age as Daniel. He's about 19, 21 years of age, ruling the kingdom of Babylon. And, and Daniel says, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let the king, I'm not going to let their pagan religion, I'm not going to let their language, I'm not going to let their ways, I'm not going to let everything, I'm not going to let them defile me. It's a matter of the will. How about your heart tonight? Blessed are the, the, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you say, well, wait a minute, you know, you're not going to see him physically. God made that clear. Nobody's going to see my face and live to tell about it. Amen? The way we see Jesus today, we see Jesus, we see God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. And they took up stones, one to blaspheme him for that. Because you, know, you know what he was doing? He was claiming to be God. And that's who he was. And that's the way we see God, because he was the image, he was the reflection of God's glory, he was the image of God, reflected God, and that's how we see God. And so, there's no contradiction in the scripture. Ephesians, Paul put it this way in verse 317, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How does he do that? By faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, you see. Let's see, this is a matter, where's he going to, God, Jesus, dwells in our heart. He wants us to dwell in our hearts so we will trust Him with all of our heart. He wants to dwell in our hearts so that we'll be glad in all of our hearts. He wants us to, 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 to dwell in our hearts so that we'll make the right decisions in our lives and, make the, and practice in using our will. See, that's what it is when we define when somebody says, what's a pure heart? Define it. We're trying to define it. And it's going to require your emotions, your intellect, and your will. Okay? So we're still defining a heart here, a pure heart. So let's look at B there in your study notes. Pure. A pure heart. A pure heart is one with. Now here's how you can start thinking about whether you've got a pure heart or not. A pure heart is one with no guile. You're going to have a pure heart before the Lord tonight because blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Okay? A pure heart is one with no guile. In other words, no deceitfulness, no cunning, no tricks. We've got a lot of that out there. We got a lot of false teachers and prophets out there that are so called claim to be and everything. What are they doing? They're using all kinds of gimmicks and tricks and everything else from growing your leg an inch and all that. And I mean, goodness, and telling you that they haven't sinned a sin in 18 years, not one sin. Folks, that's a pure, outright lie. There is no person on this planet alive that hasn't gone, it has gone 18 years without one sin. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. So if you're not righteous, you're sinning. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible says we've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. And you've got to go keep reading that in Romans about that part. Boy, he talks about a filthy mouth and goes on and on about it. I mean, so then you're going to tell me for 18 years as a man, you have never had a thought? You've never cursed a word? You've never gotten angry, exploded. 18 years since the day he got saved, he claims to be a prophet. He's never sinned. Well, right there, he sinned because he's lying. Hello. And he goes around pulling tricks, making people think that the Lord is moving and working through him, growing people's legs. And you should see they showed in slow motion how he did it. He takes the one man's leg and walks up to him and he says, oh, I see you got your one leg shorter than the other. 
than it was. He says, well, let's let God's going to take care of that and get that other one right and straighten out with you. So they showed the whole camera working in, in, in slow motion. So he's holding the guy by the ankles and all this, and you see it in slow motion, and sees what happens. And he starts pulling on the other leg. And it shows the other leg that's going to get longer than this one. And he says, see there how God's grown that other leg for you? The guy's just a baloney. People standing by watch this stuff and eat this stuff up. Oh, my, my, my. No guile. See, a pure heart of God has no guile, has no deceit, no dishonesty. Okay, are you with me, church? No, no cunningness, no tricks. If you're going to have a pure heart. A pure heart, here's the other, on the other side of that coin. A pure heart's going to have integrity. A pure heart's going to have integrity tonight. In other words, you're going to have, a, you're going to have soundness of heart. It, it embraces to a code of values, honesty, integrity does. In other words, put it this way. Integrity means living on Monday like you did on Sunday. See, that's what a pure heart is. It has integrity. They're going to live on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday like they did on Sunday. See, that's a pure heart that has integrity. Jeremiah put it this way in Jeremiah 32, 39. And I will give them one heart, he says, God speaking here. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and of their children after them. Psalms 57, 7 says, my heart is fixed. O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. This is a heart of integrity. Okay, if you've got a pure heart, you're going to have a heart of integrity. And it's going to be fixed on the Lord and, and so forth. 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hello? You've got to call on the Lord tonight. You'd better have a pure heart. See, you're not going to have a pure heart if there's sin in your life. Not going to have a pure light if you're going with unconfessed sin, unrepented sin. Matter of fact, the Bible, God says, if you cover your sin and try to hide your sin, he says, I don't even hear you. Amen. Now, you can read what Charles Spurgeon says. There's a great, great quote there, but I want to move on tonight if we can, and you'll have that to read there later. So someone says, okay, we have defined a heart. We've defined a pure heart. Okay, it has emotions, it has intellect, it has a will. A pure heart is one with no guile. A pure heart is one that has integrity. So how do I, and here's the second one, number two, a pure heart developed. See, we define the pure heart. Now tonight we've got to develop it. So here's where we get into the rubber meets the road now. Here comes some application. You've got to develop a pure heart. Folks, I'm sorry, you can't go to the pharmacy tomorrow or to the vitamin shop down here and get a vitamin pill box that has pure heart pills and take them. It, it, it's not. It, 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 you've got to develop it. So someone says, okay, now, Pastor, here you go again. You're telling me how to develop a pure heart. So how do I do it? You ready? Here we go. Right from the scriptures. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to educate yourself. See, if you want to develop a pure heart tonight, you've got to educate yourself. All right, are you with me? See, here comes your intellect's going to be involved in here. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, Solomon says. But the end thereof are the ways of death or destruction. So you've got to educate yourself. You see, acknowledge him in all your ways. See, your ways is going to bring an end to destruction. Hello? See, there's a way that seemeth right, and everybody seems right today. Nobody's wrong. Nobody makes a mistake. Nobody's at fault. It's everybody else's fault. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I'm right and always right and mark it down. You know, the, the, I, mean, just, and, 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 I mean, there's a way that seems right. But the end are the ways of death. In another passage, Paul, Paul, uh, Solomon says the ways are destruction. See, folks, you and I, we're not always right. Okay? Matthew 12, 34. Jesus put it this way. Oh, generation of vipers. He's talking to the Pharisees, the most religious group of all. He says, 
How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you got to educate yourself tonight if you're going to develop a pure heart. It's not my ways, but thy way. Okay? Not my will, but thy will be done. you got to educate. That's the first one. Okay? And here, uh, Warren Wiersbe, Dr. Wiersbe said, The heart, of course, is the source of all trouble. We are prone to blame people and circumstances, and even God, for the wrong things that we do. But the heart is really the culprit. It's a heart problem, church. Everything is the heart. What people need is a new heart. What a drug addict needs is a new heart. What an alcoholic needs is a new heart. You see, what, what violent people, with all this is going on and all this fighting in this war, it's a heart problem. You've got to get the heart of man saved and born again, and they need a new heart. It's a heart problem. Now, here's a good verse for education, okay? We're talking about we've got to educate, uh, to have a pure heart if we want to develop it. There are four steps of what I'm giving you. You've got to educate, number one. Here's a good verse for this one. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. You're going to learn something tonight. We see, we're educating ourselves to have a pure heart. You've got to come to a place of understanding, church, that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately Wicked. Who can know it? Well, God knows it. And that's what the Bible says about our heart, folks. So you've got to educate yourself. See, if you're going to have a pure heart, you've got to develop it. James put it this way in James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious, here we go, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. See, if you can't control your tongue and your mouth, you've deceived your own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we're trying to educate ourselves tonight if we want to develop a pure heart. The second one is evaluate. You have to evaluate your heart tonight. You see, we've got to evaluate it. Listen to what David says in Psalm 139, 23. Your heart, my heart, we've got to evaluate it. Notice what he said. Search me, O God. Not search somebody else. Not search another brother or sister in Christ. Not search the one in front of you, behind you, beside you in the church. No, search me and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts. How many of you saw the four, four personal pronouns that David used? Now, is that the Word of God or not? Did you see four personal pronouns? Now, some guy used to come here a long time ago, and we'd go through this and read a verse like this, and I would mention, you see the personal pronouns? See, it's not search me or search Sharon it, you know, or search George. No, search me. And after the service, he came and said, you know what? You use too many personal pronouns. Well, I'm sorry, the Word of God just used four of them. And I'm just, I didn't write it, I just quote it. He scripted, it, you know, he wrote the script and I just recite it. Okay? Proverbs 12, 20, 21, 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. What? Every way in your own eyes is right. But the Lord pondereth the heart. God sees the heart. God looks on your heart. See, you think everything you do is right in your own eyes, but God says, I'm looking at your heart tonight. See, you've got to evaluate your heart. Paul put it this way to the church of Colossae in chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey all your masters according to the flesh. Oh, wow, I'd really like to see that around here. Okay, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. What? Fearing God. Another word for fearing there is pleasing God. So you see, you want to please God tonight, you've got to be singleness of heart and obey those that have the authority over you. You've got to get to the point where you quit trying to think that everything you do is right in your own eyes because God's looking at your heart and you need to do like David says, you need to search me, O God, know my heart, try my thoughts. Hey, God knows your heart, God knows your thoughts. Let me tell you, you won't hide nothing from Him. 
So I got to do two so far. What do I got to do? If I'm going to develop my heart, I got to educate myself. I got to evaluate my own heart, not somebody else's, but mine. And then I got to eliminate. See, once you do an evaluation on your heart, then you got to do some eliminating. Eliminate anything that's not consistent uh, with God's word. Anything that's not consistent with the word of God, you got to eliminate it out of your life. Whatever, whatever it be, whatever you're going, whatever you're doing, whatever you're watching, whatever you're reading, whatever you're listening to it, whatever. If it's not consistent and lined up with the Word of God, you need to eliminate it from your heart. And so how do we do that? Confess it, forsake it, it's called repentance. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5 says. Now listen to this. For though we walk in the flesh, Paul says we walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. We don't go after it. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, you've got to pull down and I've got to pull down the strongholds that's in your life. When you've got to eliminate these things, that's what he's talking about here. You've got to pull them down. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. That's pride, arrogance, boasting. I mean, we could go on and on with it of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You've got to eliminate. James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I like what James does here. He don't really, be, he don't pull no punches here. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. I can just see old James writing that. This is the Lord's half-brother. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Now remember, he didn't get saved till after the resurrection. Okay, before then, he didn't even believe in Jesus. He was his own brother. He lived with him, grew up with him, but didn't trust him as his Savior. He wasn't saved. He wasn't born again till after the resurrection. And after the resurrection, he became an apostle. And he writes the first book of the New Testament. And I can just see old Jim saying, listen, James saying, man, you need to draw nigh to God. And if you do, he'll draw nigh to you. But before that happens, you better cleanse your ways, you sinners. <laughs> see, nobody wants to hear that today. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We got a lot of double-minded people today. And even within the church and believers. I just talked with one here a few weeks ago. And here, he, here James tells you, just purify your hearts, you're double-minded. See, if you're double-minded, you don't have a purified heart. You don't have a pure heart if you're double-minded, you see. Jeremiah 24, 7 says, I will give them a heart to know me. Now, there ought to be your prayer right here. This is God talking to Jeremiah. He's telling the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I'm going to give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. And they will shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Now that's not going to happen until the end of the millennium. But they're going to come with their whole heart. You and I ought to be praying tonight, God, give me a heart to know you. Give me a heart, God, to know you, that you are the Lord God. And I want to be your people. And I want you to be my God. And Lord, I want to come to you no matter what with my whole heart. Can't come to God half-heartedly. So how do we eliminate? Confess. Forsake. Repent. All right. Let's go to page number four to help you out here. All right. So how does God change our heart? How about your heart? Is it right with God? First of all, we looked at a pure heart defined. Then we looked at a pure heart developed. We've been talking about developing a, 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 developing a pure heart here. This is still part of it. How does God change our heart? Number one, through the Word. God's going to change your heart through the Word, church. Psalms 119, 11, Thy Word have I hid in my heart. What, church? That I might not sin against thee. You know how you keep from sinning against God? Hide the Word of God in your heart. You know what the Word of God will do? It will change your heart. Now, the sad thing is, you see, people, believe it or not, when you talk to people and get talking to people, there are people who don't want their heart changed. They're just as happy and tickled pink as they are. They're satisfied with the way they are. They don't want to change. A lot of people don't like change, but I'll tell you what, when it comes to spiritual things and to, and to the Word and all that we're looking at, you need a changed heart. And God, and, and, and God will change your heart and my heart through the Word. A second way God can change our heart is through prayer. Now, I want, you to, I want you to pick out the personal pronouns, since I preach with personal pronouns. Y'all love me still? Amen. I hope so. 
Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search, first pronoun, personal pronoun, O God, and know my heart. Try and know and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Six personal pronouns in those two verses. Now David's praying that prayer. See, you can't pray that prayer for, for somebody else. You've got to pray it for yourself. Okay? Through prayer. God can change your heart. you got a stone cold heart tonight. Let God change it. you got a bitter heart. you got an angry heart. you got an unforgiving heart tonight. Let God change it. You're holding bitterness and grudges against people. Let God change it. Got quiet. Psalms 19. All right, here you go. You get to pick out the personal pronouns again so I don't get blamed for preaching on pronouns. Psalms 19, 12 through 14, three verses. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou from secret faults. You got any secret faults tonight? See, how can God change our hearts tonight? Because all this stems and comes from the heart. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over Dominion means rule, power over me. Then shall be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of and the meditation of be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know how many is in there? Eight. Eight personal pronouns in those three. You kind of getting the idea? This thing's all about you and I. When it comes to having a pure heart, developing a heart. It's not about everybody else. See, I can't worry about what all you're going to do. See, that, that's a decision you have to make for yourself. I can't make that for you. I'm just trying to help you and help me at the same time. See, I had to study all this first so I can share it with you. You see, and i got to practice these things and deal these things in my life as well. And so there's a way God changes our heart through the Word. God changes our heart through prayer. God will change our heart through, we don't like this one, trials. Testings, temptations. How many of you like trials and temptations and testings? Anybody like those when they come? Nobody likes them, are they? They're not very pleasant, are they? But God will change your heart through it. Listen to what the, listen to what the psalmist says. This is interesting. Okay? Psalms 119.67. Notice what he says. Before I was afflicted. Before I was afflicted. What happened? I went astray. I wandered. Got away from the Lord. Went my own life, my own direction. But now have I kept thy word. In other words, he was going through a trial and a test, and God was using the trial and the test in his life to bring him back around. He said, now I'm going to keep your word. Because before I was afflicted, he said, I was wandering, having a good time, living out in sin and living it up before I was afflicted. Now that I'm afflicted. See, God will use things sometimes in our lives that change our hearts. And then those aren't the pleasant ones. I, I'd rather have God change my heart through the Word, and that's not too pleasant either because the Word will cleanse you. And it cleanses you, okay? I'd rather have God change my heart through prayer, but be careful of that too because, boy, God will. But, oh, man, through the trials. I don't know about those. Well, there's a fourth step we have to take. So we've got to educate. We've got to evaluate. We've got to eliminate. Now we've got to encapsulate. There's a big word for you, Encapsulate. What does that mean? That means to uh, encase or to become encased in a capsule. Okay? Are you with me, church? How God's going to change? And we're talking about having a pure heart, developing it. Okay? So I got to encapsulate my heart. Proverbs 4.23. Keep. The word keep there is also translated guard. Keep thy heart. Guard thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of light. See, the word keep means to guard or to seal your heart like you would encapsulate it. You've got to guard your heart. See, the spiritual heart inside of you. You've got to encapsulate it. You've got to seal it, you see. A good conscience is a continual Christmas. That's Benjamin Franklin quote. All right, so there, there's, how we, there's how we develop a pure heart. We educate ourselves. We evaluate ourselves. We eliminate the things in our life that the Word of God reveals to us. And then we guard our heart. We seal our heart and, and keep it with all diligence. Well, lastly tonight, 
So there's a pure heart defined. We see a pure heart that's uh, developed. Now how about a pure heart displayed? See, after God's done something, you need to display it. Amen? A pure heart display. Now here you go. This is, how do we start off? This, how do we start off? What do we say? Matthew 5, 8. All right, Sermon on the Mount, right? Here we go. But the very verse we read, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen? Now we come down to John 1, 18 in the New Testament. No man has seen God at any time. Hey, there you go, preacher. There's a contradiction in the Word of God. I got you right there. There's a contradiction. No. No man has seen God at any time. Only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. First Timothy 6, 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. Amen. Well, wait a minute. Jesus said, blessed, happy, fully satisfied are the pure in heart. So in other words, preacher, if I have uh, defined a pure heart, my emotions, intellect, and will, okay, if, if I've learned to, a pure heart has no guile, it has integrity, all right, I've developed my pure heart through education, through evaluating it, through eliminating things in my life, allowing the Word of God in prayer and trials to take care of it, I've encapsulated and sealed and guarded my heart, so what is, how, how is the town where am I going to see God? If Jesus said the pure in heart shall see God. Even Exodus, look in the Old Testament. And he said, Thou cannot see my face. This is God talking to Moses on the mount. For there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Amen. And will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So how is the pure in heart going to see God? Are you ready for this? Before I get into all of it. First of all, number one, how do we see God today? We see God in creation. How does the pure in heart see God today? We see God in creation. Now, folks, you can go outside tonight. If it's a clear night, you're going to see a beautiful moon, and you're going to see stars, and you're going to see sunsets tonight, beautiful one. You're going to see a sunrise in the morning. That's how you see God. You see God in creation, and it's all around you. When you go to the Rocky Mountains and go up into the Rockies, you see God. When you go up into Vermont and you go up to uh, Mont, uh, Killington, Vermont, and a ski lodge there, uh, been there, you're going to see God in all of his creation. When you go to Mount Pleasant uh, there uh, in New upper state New York on the upper Hudson and go to Mount Pleasant there where the Olympics were at, I've been there, and you're going to see God in his creation. When you go to Alaska... You're going to see God in His creation. When you see all the northern lights and everything, you're going to see God in the mountains majestic, in Mount McKinley, the highest mountain in North America. You're going to see God in all of His creation. That's how we see God. You're going to see God when you go to the delivery room tomorrow and see a brand new baby. There's life, creation. Psalms 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. That's how you can see God. Amen. You go to Romans chapter 1 and read it. It begins off there, and Paul begins to tell them that that's how they saw God, but oh, they didn't want to take that. They didn't want that. I'll tell you another way we see God. We see God in salvation. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I'm telling you, if all of you are saved here tonight, I see God's salvation. And I see God. And every time I see a lost man or woman get saved, guess what? I see God. 
moving in the heart of that person, a drug addict, a drunk, a, a whoremonger, you name it, an abortionist, you, 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 whatever, whatever lifestyle that they're living in, whenever they get a change in their heart and God changes their heart and they come to know Christ, I see God at work. I see God at work in your lives all the time. Those of you that are growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord and under the teaching of the ministries of this church, I see God at work. See, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, you're not going to see God if you don't have a pure heart. If your heart's all dirty with sin and, and everything else, ugliness, you're not going to see God until you get that thing cleared up. I'll tell you another, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, today the believer that's pure in heart will see God in creation. We see God in salvation. We see God in supplications. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence. How many of you got confidence tonight? That we have in Him, that is Christ, that if we ask anything. Now everybody stops right there. And they don't want to read the rest of the verse. All right, are you with me? The rest of the verse says, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, because he hears us according to his will, right? Then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him, as long as they're in accordance with his will. Somebody says, well, how do I know what God's will is? Read the Bible. It's full of it. Lady called me this past week, last week. Should I tithe? I said, read the Bible. Is it God's will? Read the Bible. I don't mean that being ugly, but that's the truth. There are certain things you don't have to pray about. Do you know that? When it comes to knowing God's will, there are certain things you don't have to pray about that you already know they're God's will. My goodness. But I see God through creation tonight. I see God in salvation tonight. I see God in supplications tonight. And I see God in the scriptures. Hello, I see God in the scriptures. Listen to what John 5, 39, Jesus said. Search the scriptures. Why should I search the scripture, Jesus? For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. You see, you're going to see God in the Scriptures. You're going to see Jesus in the Scriptures because the Scriptures testify of God. Amen. That's why Jesus again said in Matthew 12, 34 about the generation of vipers, How can ye be evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Now watch this. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. You see, a man that has, has a pure heart tonight, he's going to bring about forth good things. He's going to speak about good things from his heart. And he searches the scriptures. So tonight, inside out purity, a pure heart. We tried to define, first of all, what a pure heart is. And we looked at that. We learned that it has emotions, intellect. It has a will. Then we looked at a pure heart. There's no guile in a pure heart. A pure heart is a heart full of integrity. Then we looked about, well, okay, now we've got to develop this pure heart now that I have defined it. Okay? So I've got to educate myself. Well, okay, praise God. Amen, right? After I educate myself, then I've got to evaluate my heart now that I know something about it. See, once we know something, God wants us to do something. See, once we know the Scripture and once we've heard the truth, which you've heard tonight, we're responsible for the truth of how we respond to it or not respond to it. See, we can respond to it in faith and believing it and trusting it, or we'll not respond to it in disobedience. It's that simple. Okay? So I evaluate my heart. And then I eliminate anything that's in our, in our heart that's, that, that's in contrary to the Word of God. Then we say, well, how do we have God change my heart? He'll change your heart through the Word, through prayer, through trials. Then I got to encapsulate it. I need to, I need to guard it. I need to seal it in my heart. 
And then I need to display my pure heart. And we begin. Blessed, happy, fully satisfied are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. That's a promise from God. And when you have a pure heart tonight, you can't help but praise Him and see the handiwork that He's done in creation. You can't help see God in salvation. I'm telling you, every time a person gets saved, man, there's the work of God. You see God working in the lives of believers all the time. Around here, I've seen it. And then we see God in our supplications if God answers prayer. We see God all the time through the Scripture. And after all, church, Jesus said, Hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. You realize we will see him face to face. And when Jesus comes for his church in the clouds of glory, you're not just seeing Jesus coming. That's not just the Son of God coming. Not just the Son of Man coming, okay? It is God himself. And we will see him. And we're going to spend an eternity with him. It's going to be wonderful. But you see, there's no excuse for us tonight not to see God now. And we can if we have a pure heart. How about your heart? Is it right with God? If not, then we all have some work to do, don't we? Yeah. And we've learned how to do that tonight. Okay? So now that we've gained some insight into the Scriptures, and tonight, now that we've gained some understanding illumination, now we need to ask the Spirit of God to give us wisdom on how to apply that. And when it's all said and done, that not out of tooting your horn or blowing a trumpet, you can honestly in the quietness of your heart and your closet say, Lord, I believe now I have a pure heart for you and I want to see you. Amen. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for its truth. Thank you that it speaks to us, reproves, rebukes, instructs, corrects, instructs. We thank you for it. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that speaks to us. Now, Lord, help us to take... We got a lot of information tonight, Lord. We got a lot of illumination tonight from the Word. Now, help us to apply it as we go from this place. And we can start even tonight applying what we've heard and so that we can be that one who is happy, who is fully satisfied because we are pure in heart and we shall see God. So Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Everybody with me in verse 15? For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. Paul's giving us, uh, we got this, what he's sharing with them. It is a direct revelation from God. Now, I'm sorry for all these bulls out here that don't believe this. Don't believe in the rapture of the church and everything that's going to take place. And so that it's all spiritual. And, and again, like that 2,000 years. Now, I feel sorry for you. I'm sorry that you don't have no blessed hope. And the reason why they don't have any hope because they haven't believed. Paul made that very clear, church. He said, if we believe. That's where it all starts. You've got to have a starting point. And you're going to have this open heart. And this is certainty from the Lord. What is by the word of the Lord? Direct revelation. Paul's teaching on the rapture was not his own speculation, but direct revelation from God. That's why I believe in the rapture, because it's direct revelation from God. Matter of fact, there's stuff going on here this week and so forth, folks, and, and it's, it's true. Listen to me. We're not in the tribulation right now. You understand that? We're not in the first part of it. We're not in the middle of it. We're not in the end of it. You understand that? We're not in the battle of Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 of that battle. We're not in that battle, okay? You understand that? That battle's not going to take place. We're not in the trib right now because I'm still here. 
All that takes place when the church is raptured out. Then the Antichrist is revealed. Then there's a peace covenant treaty signed between Israel and the ten, Air, and the ten confederation of the Arab nations will sign that peace treaty. And then it'll go along for a while. Gog and Magog then will attack Russia, including Syria and Iran. And that's when the Antichrist is going to defend Israel and take care of all that. And they're going to just, oh man, he is it. He is the Messiah. Look what he's done. Then all of a sudden he's going to walk into the temple. He's going to desecrate the temple because they're going to build it and hadn't been built yet. That's why we're not there yet, you see. He's going to desecrate the temple, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 9, 27. You see, so that's why I know we're not there yet because the church is still here. So don't worry about all this that's going on. It's got to happen. It's part of God's plan. But it's not the battle of Gog and Magog. It's not the tribulation. The Antichrist is not here. And the church hasn't got raptured out yet. What we got to do is get the blessed hope out. We've got to get the message out. I understand today that right now they're, they're calling up some of the reserves in Israel, the IDF or something like that, that are reservists. You know, because in Israel it's mandatory when you grow up as a kid and you turn a young adult, whatever it is, you serve two years in the military. Everybody, women, everybody. And they've called it up today. One of the young ladies was called up. Her and her husband both are in the, in the reserves. And they've been called up. And she's a Messianic Jew. And she said, we realize what God has called us up for today. She said, there's about a thousand of us in the IDF of, this, uh, of that that are Messianic Jews. And God has raised us up for this hour of this time to be a light among the Jewish, our own people. Hallelujah. They're going to share that blessed hope.